Uh, hi everyone, my name is uh, Yuri. Uh, I would like to present today uh, a work we did on pattern matching uh, for C++. Uh, this is a joint work that was done uh, together with Dr. Desrace and Dr. Straustrup uh, back at, uh, at Texas A&M University. Um, so what is pattern? Uh, pattern is a, some sort of uh, concise uh, description uh, for a structure of interest. What that structure is, we will talk a little bit more in details. This is usually implied argument, which is called subject. Uh, what is pattern matching then? Uh, pattern matching is essentially uh, an efficient decision procedure that, that can uh, uh, match the subject to the pattern. Usually you would have a set of patterns and you will match a subject against a set of those patterns. And uh, the compilers usually vary in the how efficient can they be in generating that decision procedure. So uh, you uh, are already familiar with a lot of uh, patterns, the, the typical patterns that most uh, uh, typical of the uh, file, file masks, and the subject is file. Regular expressions where the subject is a string. Um, grammar, don't treat it really as a, I mean, it's a big as grammar, so obviously it represents IST, but like you can, in, ge in general, you can treat it as grammar is also some sort of description of a, of a valid uh, program, and program is a subject. Uh, you can treat mathematical notation as a pattern too, because it essentially allows us to decompose mathematical values into, su into uh, components. Uh, other typical ones are the, the bit masks and the value uh, that we apply. Uh, function, uh, I mean, not just function, but the, in general, uh, templates in C++ are a great example of pattern matching. Uh, overload resolution is essentially uh, doing like a pattern matching on the structure of the type at compile time based on the arguments. Uh, and of course, template metaprogramming, it essentially uh, uses the same um, ideas and, as functional languages. Uh, you, can, you can think of exception handling and exception, I mean, exception handling as pattern matching and exception as a subject, because essentially we have here, uh, like if the exception is thrown here, we have here a first fit match to whatever the catch block, uh, the first catch block that, that can handle that exception. Uh, there is plenty of uh, pattern matching, like uh, when you have to deal with uh, XML. Um, you can think of some uh, uh, lattices as, uh, as, as patterns, essentially, because they, they represent sets of uh, values. Um, a very important and subtle thing uh, is uh, what's the difference between pattern matching and pattern recognition? So uh, I, I never paid attention to this uh, until I, I had a, uh, I was very fortunate to, to, to have an interview with one uh, uh, big company who essentially does both. And I couldn't understand like why they, they kept uh, setting me up for interviews with machine learning teams. And I was like, I have like zero back, I mean, last time I did something was like third, uh, third uh, year at university. And they keep insisting I have to interview with these machine learning terms, and I, I, I didn't know what the machine learning term was, which is pattern recognition, but, uh, which, which added to the confusion. Uh, I only knew like the, the Ukrainian term for, for, for the machine learning term. And at some point it kind of rang a bell, and I said, okay, maybe it actually has the same word in it. And I looked up on Wikipedia, indeed. So pattern matching is essentially a programming languages term. Uh, Pattern recognition is a machine learning term. They deal with the similar stuff. Uh, here we, we try to check and decompose perceived structure. There we try to assign labels. Uh, there is a, uh, a subtle different difference. So uh, in uh, machine learning, we are looking for most likely matching. So we essentially have a lot of data points and we are trying to, to figure out uh, the, the closest description of them and we are okay with false positives or false negative. Um, these patterns are learned. Essentially, the machine is lear learning them. What's important there is the accuracy of pattern recognition, not, uh, not the efficiency. Uh, so we are dealing more with synthesis in machine learning. Uh, in uh, programming languages, in pattern matching, we're dealing more with analysis. The, the matching is exact, so uh, patterns represent predicates, essentially. Uh, we're dealing with pre-existing patterns, so the developer gives us patterns, and what matters is the efficiency of this pattern matching algorithm. Uh, so you can think also like that pattern matching obtained via machine learning, uh, the pattern obtained via machine learning, it can be eventually encoded with the facilities available as, uh, 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 in, in programming languages as, as through pattern matching. Is this uh, clear? Okay, so 
different languages have different semantics for pattern matching. Typically, most of the function languages have uh, first fit semantics. Uh, languages like, uh, for example, in C++, we, we don't give a preference to what we've seen first, so it's uh, usually a best fit. Um, C likes switch statements and uh, other languages that have a similar construct. It's uh, what we call exact fit. Some other languages, they may have like either all fit or like any fit uh, can be deterministic, non-deterministic, et cetera, et cetera. So there is uh, some variation there. Um, so let's look at some examples of patterns in other languages. Um, and I would like to also kind of show what kind of patterns we have here. The, the one important thing uh, you have to always remember when you deal with pattern matching, there is always left-hand side and right-hand side, okay? So uh, usually it will be indicated either with, uh, with the equality, I mean the assignment or e equality. Sometimes it's going to be indicated with essentially the, the action symbol, like where, where where uh, you, you, you say what you are going to do once the pattern is recognized. But there is always left-hand side and right-hand side. And essentially the same, uh, the same term, the same expression in the left-hand side uh, means something different than it, it means in the right-hand side. For example, uh, one in the left-hand side here means pattern, uh, value pattern one. One here is just a value one. Uh, similar, uh, uh, for example, uh, let me, sh where can I see, like, uh, X in this part means a variable pattern uh, because it's in the left-hand side. The same variable here uh, is, uh, is essentially represents the value of that uh, uh, vari bound variable. So in Mathematica, like, they have this extra notation where you, uh, they ask you to explicitly uh, mark uh, when you use it as a, a pattern versus value, but that's a minor thing. So what else? Uh, we can have some operations on patterns like this or, which is called combinator, uh, pattern combinator. And essentially we say when the argument is either zero or one, the result is one. Um, we can have, so this is another value pattern. We can have wild, uh, the, the most typical is wild ca card pattern, which means I don't care about the value of that argument. Um, here, uh, this, this is uh, in the Haskell, essentially uh, a shorthand for the list constructor. Uh, a syntactic sugar essentially. Here also it means match exactly the empty list. There it means the empty list value. Um, there, are, there used to be some um, interesting patterns in Haskell. They actually got deprecated. So there was something called like n plus k patterns, which is a, a, a pattern of the form variable plus constant. And the meaning of that uh, pattern was uh, uh, essentially, okay, bind the actual, uh, match the actual argument and kind of solve the equation. So uh, the, the actual, if, the, if you have an argument A, then the value of N will be A minus one if, uh, if A is greater than one um, or greater or equal, et cetera. So you can decompose uh, things through the, uh, like this is essentially a, a, a list constructor uh, in Haskell. So you can say, okay, uh, if I have N plus one, uh, if I have to take N plus one, and uh, I have the, the, the head of the list and tail, um, you can do this very nice recursion. There are some other uh, interesting patterns. So for example, in uh, Erlang is first of all very famous for bit patterns. Uh, a lot of protocols get written in it uh, because of that. Um, uh, this is an example where essentially we kind of like show uh, be because it's in the left hand side, it's still a pattern, it's not, it's not an expression. Uh, it, it's like string concatenation, but essentially what we mean here is we, we take it uh, backwards. We say, okay, if the actual argument starts from prefix, match whatever goes after prefix into this variable and use that variable in the right hand side. Uh, so these are the, the main kind of example. Another important example is, uh, is that it's available in some languages. Some languages allow you to use the same variable twice in the le left-hand side, uh, which means actually this, this is called equivalence patterns, uh, which means the pattern would only match if in both positions the arguments are the same, the subjects are the same. Uh, does this make sense? Uh, Haskell, for example, and OCaml, they don't allow it because, uh, because the variables are implicitly introduced, so there are some uh, type checking issues uh, with it. Uh, type inference, uh, and, uh, but others do. And we will see, uh, by example, there are some ways to work around it in other languages. Any questions with regard to this? Okay. So, uh, of course, uh, pattern matching became most popular because what's called tree or constructor patterns. And um, the, those are very, very directly related to what's called algebraic data types. So, imagine uh, we would like to write a simple calculator 
of, uh, of a language that is given by this uh, simple uh, uh, grammar. Uh, this is an example of a tree in that. Um, in functional languages, a term in this uh, language will typically be represented with uh, this recursive algebraic data type with variants that correspond to productions. And yeah, you can see it's uh, recursive. Uh, the, Im the important point here is the variants are disjoint. So the set of values, the, the set of values belonging to them, they don't intersect. And the entire algebraic data type is closed. What it gives us, it gives us to like once, once we have to, to do some, uh, some analysis on those data types, it gives us very clean recursive structure. Like, okay, for example, to be able to evaluate this term, we just uh, do a pattern matching on the E and uh, on the uh, root uh, uh, constructor, and we recursively call um, to, to do this nice, nice structure an an analysis. Uh, it's very elegant. Uh, it's very easy to explain this to students. Uh, they understand it almost like from, from day one. And they can use it. Intuitive, it's direct show of intent. Uh, it, it gives us extensibility of functions, which is like we can add as many functions as we want on this algebraic data type and uh, uh, do the same kind of ca case analysis. Uh, it's checked, so the compiler can, t because, because this is a closed type and uh, the variants are disjoint, we can check for both redundancy, which means like uh, is, is subsequent case is uh, more, uh, sorry, more special than the previous case. Kind of like in, in, exception, uh, in exception handling, we have that uh, your previous catch block is more general than this, the next catch block, and the compiler will give you warning. Uh, we can also check for exhaustiveness. Does your set of patterns cover, cover the entire set of possibilities? Um, it, uh, the very important thing, it's, it gives us also local reasoning. So like we see everything in this function. We don't have to jump you know, to other f uh, source files, etc. It also can be relational, which means we can compare uh, two or three arguments by simply putting them into tuple, and we will see that uh, in, in an example. The disadvantage, uh, we will talk about it uh, in subsequent classes, I mean, the slides. Uh, other, another uh, really nice advantage is the, the Patterns in functional languages, they can nest. So imagine that in our calculator, we would like to write uh, some sort of um, uh, tr transformers that transform these kind of expressions into these kind of expressions. Very easy to express. We simply do the, the case analysis on the subject. Uh, and okay, we say if it's a plus of uh, two products, and then Here's because, because the reason, ideally we wanted to write x and x, but uh, this is in OCaml. Uh, but OCaml doesn't support uh, nonlinear uh, patterns. So uh, we have to do two variables and we have to say they're equal. Then we just transform. Very elegant, very easy, very easy to understand. Uh, and this is what I was saying about relational. Uh, so pattern matching can also be relational. Uh, if we have to compare, for example, two terms deeply, whether they, th those terms are equal, uh, we can uh, do it simply by, uh, okay, we do the, the matching on the tuple of these two terms, and then the, uh, we pattern match against tuples of patterns. And we, we still get the very clear uh, recursive structure. If both are values, we just compare the, what, the, uh, what values they hold. If both are plus, we, comp we recursively descend to, to uh, uh, operands, etc., etc. Very clean and recursive structure. So why? pattern matching in, uh, in object-oriented languages. Um, here's uh, kind of one of the canonical examples. This is, this is the entire red, I mean, you don't have to try to understand this code. I, I'm just giving you kind of in terms of lines of code. This is the entire functions that does red, black tree balancing in OCaml. And you kind of can see like your, your, t your canonical book uh, examples, the cases here. You can see, okay, if it's, uh, you know, like this or this, rotate it this way, if it's this or this, rotate. So you kind of can see that structure here, okay? And then if you want to implement insertions that calls this function, this is like an extra three lines of code. So essentially, this page implements the entire insertion with balancing into red black tree. Like, this is an incomplete imperative implementation in, I just remember, C or C++, uh, I found it somewhere, of just this part. There's like tons of cases and uh, et cetera, which, uh, most of which I don't understand because they recursively call each other and it's uh, not even clear whether it terminates, et cetera. 
but uh, uh, where, where would you expect to have more bugs? And that's essential. So we would like to have something like this in uh, C++ so, we, so that we don't have to write that code. We ideally, we want the compiler to generate this code. Okay, so uh, uh, what I would like to, uh, to mention also, um, Ideal, eventually, eventually, we would like to uh, propose a language feature uh, that will extend C++ with pattern matching. Uh, right now, we, ex uh, we experiment this through a library. Uh, so, uh, uh, I will see, you will see it in the next slide. Um, but for the eventual language feature, we would like to take, uh, we would like to get, have the best of the functional world and we would like to, to keep the specifics of the object-oriented world in uh, especially C++. So we would like it to be uh, still very simple and intuitive like we saw, very easy to teach because alternatives are not that right now in C++. It should be direct show of intent, checked ideally, non-intrusive, so we should be able to retroactively apply to our data structures. Um, and it should be open ideally with respect to both classes uh, that we analyze and uh, I mean data types that we analyze and set of patterns. So the set of patterns should not be hard coded into the language like it is in most of the other languages. Um, the, the, when we design such a feature it's important to, that uh, such a feature works with uh, the C++ object model. So it should work with both built-in and user-defined times. It, is, it, do, it, do, it should support multiple inheritance and dynamic linking which is de facto uh, happening uh, uh, today in C++, even though it's not part of the standard. Uh, and it should be comparable to or faster to any known workarounds with which people do this kind of uh, facilities, and we will talk about those uh, more. Now, the goals for these libraries were the one and most important goal was like to turn around ideas as quickly as we can without having to implement all this in, uh, in a compiler, because uh, that's uh, it's much, much more effort. And we would like to experiment with, with anything we can, like with syntax, semantics, type checking, anything we can still fit in the library, you know, like and can kind of get an idea about it, great. Um, we also, uh, like the library setting al uh, also kind of forces ourselves to remain within the open scenario because we cannot hard code anything for the compiler. So it, we kind of have to, to be in this like active libraries uh, setting. Now, we also would like to gain experience. Um, like what uh, maybe smaller uh, improvements in the C++ uh, language will help make it uh, either library or feature you know, easier. Uh, what of what we experimented can be generalized maybe and become like a, a separate feature. Uh, are there like where would be the performance bottlenecks? Uh, also like we would like to write a couple or rewrite a couple of applications to see you know like how whether it makes sense, doesn't make sense, etc. Uh, we would like to receive feedback uh, from users, so like what's intuitive, what's confusing, etc., and uh, how users typically use the library. And uh, please uh, uh, ignore, like you will see a bunch of macros and template metaprogramming kind of stuff. Uh, uh, please treat it that it's, it's a, a, yes, it's just for experimentation. By no means it's going to be the final syntax for the language feature. It's just because we could. Yes, please. Just so we see the kind of range of things. So, uh, yes, sure. Uh, uh, the typical one, okay, you, you want to, you have a, your shape hierarchy or something. You want to say, okay, if it's a rectangle, do this. If it's a circle, do that, you know. Uh, you can have, you know, your object and uh, shape. And, uh, sorry, I re the question, the typical, the typical use cases for these kind of applications. Uh, in the gaming, uh, you have objects colliding with other objects. Uh, usually you want to see, okay, if it's this object uh, collides with this object, do this. If this kind of object collides with this kind of object, do that. There was a, a talk yesterday where uh, uh, they had to analyze, uh, I don't remember, it was something like, uh, like the packets, uh, the kind of packets that were arrived, and those were also represented with different types. So any, any, anything that has some nested structure, that you would uh, like where you would typically have to write a lot of nested if statements if it's this and then parts of this are this and this do this so anywhere where you you need to recognize some sort of structure you would be able to do and uh, you would you would be able to use this kind of approach um, so yes uh, the library is uh, is uh, there's quite a lot, a lot of hacks uh, the idea is just to gain experience, so treat it as such, like ignore the fact that we also don't like macros, so uh, please forgive us for that. 
All right, so to give you the feel of the library, here's uh, essentially the same uh, uh, evaluator of the expression la language side by side in C++ using, using our library, which is called uh, Max7, and OCaml. So in C++, we declare uh, essentially, we have a base type and we declare a variance as derived type, which is one of the encodings, not the only encoding. Um, and then uh, the, uh, the evaluation s simply becomes a uh, clean uh, recursive structure, on, uh, recursive uh, algorithm on the structure of this expression, which mimics exactly what we see in the OCaml world. Um, you will see through the presentation, everything you see in this color, these are macros, okay? And they generate some code, and I'll give you some idea what exactly they generate. But this is the kind of thing. The only thing that is still missing here is how do we define what's, uh, uh, what should be bound in the first argument, what should be bound in the second argument. And user does this retroactively, so user doesn't have to change his type. So you see, like, we didn't have to in inject anything in the existing classes. You can apply this. Uh, user specializes this class bindings, which is a library class, and it says, okay, for the class value, the first argument that should be bound is this, and this is a member pointer, and those can be either data member pointers or uh, like uh, getters, essentially pointers to getters and stuff. Um, same for like, for example, plus, we are saying, okay, in the first argument, we should bound to the argument E1, uh, operand E1, in the second, we should bound to the operand E2. Etc. And this is essentially everything the user has to note that this has to be written once for your class hierarchy, and then you can use it as many times in, as you want. Plus, uh, note it can be parameterized. So if your classes are parameterized, it can also be parameterized. So, you, yes? Uh, does it have access to the private No. So, you, s you, I mean, you, still, you still get the encapsulation because uh, this essentially, uh, I mean, uh, eventually this will resolve into the uh, call through a point. So if, if from the outside you don't have access to these members, yes, uh, you, I mean, you, you will have to change in that uh, type as a class. But if, you have, if your data uh, member is private, but you have a getter for that data member, you, you will just put a, a, a name of the getter here and it will work. Okay? Uh, so the question was uh, actually uh, uh, what if, the, if the, some of the members are private? Uh, sorry, uh, remind me to re repeat the question. Um, so here's the second example, uh, essentially where we had the nesting of patterns. Uh, so we still do the, the same. One thing I forgot to mention on the previous uh, slide. Uh, in functional languages, we have implicit introduction of variables, uh, which we don't in C++. So we have to explicitly declare our variable patterns. Okay. And that's the disadvantage, which is okay. Uh, so far, we, we experiment with it. But like, uh, one, once you declare it, your variable patterns, you do essentially the same recursive structure as here. It's actually even cleaner. Like where here, uh, you had to say, because, uh, because uh, uh, nonlinear patterns are not allowed, you have to declare two variables and compare them. Here we, in the library, because we can introduce new combinators, we, inc we introduce what's called uh, equivalence combinator, which is uh, an overload of unary plus. And we say, okay, bind the variable pattern here, but then don't bind it there, but compare the currently bound value. So treat the value already inside the pattern as a, as a constant, uh, as a value pattern, essentially. So uh, that way we can express, okay, this should be the same. Does it make sense? And uh, we'll, we'll talk more uh, about this. But uh, because the set of patterns and combinators are open, this is the kind of thing we can do. Uh, the important thing here is this is a language solution. Uh, the set of patterns is hard-coded in the language, in OCaml or a lot of other languages. Uh, the nice part, there is a very uh, implicit variable introduction. Linearity is what I said that uh, uh, that nonlinear patterns are not allowed, so you have to, to compare them. Here, it's a library solution right now. All patterns are user-defined, so there is nothing hard-coded. A uh, library doesn't know about any specific of that. Uh, essentially, all the patterns you see here are user-definable. Uh, th there is explicit variable introduction, and we can introduce our own combinators, like the equivalence one. Yes? So what's the goal of this library? Is it to be something released that people use, or just to have influence on 
so yes, it's actually uh, uh, released uh, right now. It's not very polished. Uh, the question was, what's the goal of this library? Uh, so the, the goal is uh, how we started this library. Uh, so after I was taking a, a class from like Gabi and uh, or Dr. Sars, were like the, like there's a lot of these like compiler classes, and every time we had to use visitor design pattern, and visitor design pattern is a hack, and it's really like if you try to teach somebody visitor design pattern, they they get it like in a week of debugging, you know, like it's 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 extremely hard for somebody to understand how it works, uh, and even worse, you know, like to use it efficiently, uh, so. At some, at some point, I decided, okay, I don't care about, I'm going to write the slowest thing possible, but something that can give me the expressivity of functional languages uh, in dealing with this. It was some compiler class uh, that uh, they were teaching, and we had to do some toy language, etc. So we, we were trying to essentially bring kind of like a, a similar looking pattern matching facility uh, that we can experiment with. In, at that point, we didn't care uh, that it's might be slow, okay, as long as it's kind of like, uh, you know, direct show of intent. Uh, it's not slow anymore, and I'll, I'll try to convince you through the presentation. Yes? Um, so, why would someone want to use this as opposed to just like a boost variant? Because if you use this, you lose your value semantics, you've got introduction of these extra variables just sitting there. So, so this, uh, the question is, why would you, somebody use uh, this one versus uh, boost variant? So boost variants is a, re is a representation of algebraic data type. Okay? It, boost variant doesn't solve your uh, uh, problem for analyzing that data type. For example, uh, if, if you want to analyze the deep nesting, okay, you, you will still be pretty much in the same setting like what visitors give you. The nesting is not easily expressed with variants because you cannot easily say, okay, my I should have a variant which is plus, and then like you know like sub variants that are this or that or that, you know, and they should have this pattern. So you will still have to write tons of like these nested if statements to analyze that structure. The pattern matching is about analysis of the structure, not about uh, it. it it's, uh, it doesn't affect your your value semantics. You can still have your value semantics. You can still have and, and you can apply this to boost variant and stuff. Uh, so you can analyze, uh, it doesn't have to be per se class like this, okay? And we will see there are other encodings of this. Did I answer your question? Okay. There is. I assume this is a first match? Uh, yes, a good question. Uh, yes, uh, it's a f uh, the, question, the question was, uh, is it a first match? Uh, here it's a first match. Uh, the library does not only support first match, and when, I, when we will talk about the other encodings that we support, I will briefly mention that, okay? But yes, this is first match. So we can also do relational matching. Uh, we decided not to, to go to follow the, the route of uh, uh, like kind of embedding in tuples and then decomposing the tuples, because especially in the library uh, uh, setting, it will be hard to to take out that extra, you know, unless you have a very good optimizer. Uh, so instead, we support multiple arguments, okay, directly in, in, in the match statement. And this is exactly uh, the same recursive structure. You say, okay, if I have, this is, uh, uh, you, you would like to implement an equality of two terms. And uh, you, you do exactly the same. You say, if I have two values, their, their actual values should be the same. And then we return true. If I have two pluses, okay, bind this first operand here, bind the second operand here, and check that they are the same there, okay? Uh, otherwise, return false. Exactly the same, uh, uh, you know, structure, actually even uh, shorter. Uh, here we have single scrutiny. Remember that here we have a closed world, both in terms of the set of patterns and the algebraic data type is closed. Uh, one second. Uh, but as an advantage of this, we get the exhaustiveness checking, redundancy checking, and compiler optimization. Here, we get the multiple scrutiny, which is uh, multiple subjects, essentially. We have open world, both with respects to patterns and the set of classes, and we will talk about it more. Um, and so we have new patterns combinations. Yes, Eric? This is kind of an aside, but shouldn't 1 plus 2 equal 2 plus 1? Uh, but that's already like the, that's the specifics of your domain. Yeah. So he, here, 
we are comparing expression. We are not comparing the values. Yeah. So I mean, imagine that in those expression you had variables and stuff. So so it's more like a symbolic comparison than you know like actually. There is. If, if you are working on an application where you would like to implement that, you can use the pattern matching to implement that. But no, you, you, you don't get that. The question was, uh, you don't get like any sort of uh, you know, algebraic properties, commutativity and stuff. We don't make any assumption about your trees. The, the semantics of your trees is, the, sem is your, your, the semantics of your domain. So we just help you to analyze the trees. And what, uh, what you would like to do with them, it's totally up to you. Question, there was. So this is an integer variable. So the value holds an integer. And th this binds to the operands. So the question was why uh, we have n separately from a and b. Uh, yes, here. So in the OCaml case, you do a recursive check. Where is the recursive check? In the yes, I, I, I was waiting for this question. That's a great question. Uh, so that recursive check is hidden in the plus uh, in the equivalence combinator. OK? So because, because uh, equivalence combinator is essentially implemented in terms of the, and that's where you also get your value semantics, it's implemented in terms of the actual e uh, equality operator on the term. Uh, the implement, like once, uh, once that plus gets evaluated, and uh, we'll talk about how, how it's, it will forward it to here. So, so that recursive calls are hidden in those pluses. M. N. N. So it will get it two, two, two times. So it will get bound. Like let's say I have a tree where I have value three. I mean of value five. So N will get bound to three here, and it will get overwritten to five there. And in the right hand side, the value of N will be five. So you will lose it. Uh, so so uh, the, the comment was that uh, if uh, maybe we should do like uh, ensure that if n is, is bounded, we should not uh, bind it again. But uh, remember, this is a, a library setting. Like we can do this kind of things in the compiler setting. But in a library setting, like that would mean you can use every variable essentially once and you will have to declare every variable. And just to not do that and not to, to sacrifice your runtime, we, we, we don't. In the, it's a choice we made in the library setting. But the night, okay. Okay, okay. Let, let, me give you, let, let me give you a better answer to your question. Let me give you a better question. This variable pattern, it's a user definable pattern. I wrote it as a user of the library. Okay? If you don't like it, you can write a checked variable pattern which will do your semantics, your, your vision, and you can use it with the rest of the library. So that, uh, it, the, the library is transparent to that. Any other questions? Yes. On the left hand side, you get a number of patterns and you get one body for them. Yeah. For plus, plus, minus yeah. Uh, you, uh, you, uh, so the question was uh, you get a number of patterns essentially uh, combined through the, through the uh, uh, disjunction combinator and you have a, sim a s uh, single body essentially for them. Uh, while we support this junction, uh, you will see later the reason I split it in separate cases because we would like to use the efficient type switch that is behind this. This, this essentially becomes more efficient than your visitor design pattern. Okay? So for efficiency reasons, we keep it separate. Okay? And we will see more details on that more, uh, later. Any other questions on this? Okay. So uh, a, a few words about combinators. Uh, Many languages uh, have uh, pattern combinators. What, what, what are those? They're essentially operators for creating new patterns or modifying the existing patterns, the, the subtle value. So patterns, you have to think about patterns. They are very similar to, uh, to your lambda functions. They are essentially one-use predicates. Okay? Uh, they, can, 
they can also bind parts of it, uh, you know, like, but so, so can lambdas if you pass it by, by reference, etc. Uh, the important, uh, the subtle difference with patterns is the, the subject is implicit. Like with lambdas, your arguments are explicit. Uh, here, the subjects are implicit, and you combine essentially the, the, these, these patterns without subjects. V while when you compose uh, lambdas, etc., you will have to essentially explicitly redirect your arguments and say where, where they go. So, uh, what kind of, uh, and, uh, what kind of uh, combinators we added right now? And remember, all of these are user-definable. So, I just knew they exist in other languages, so I added it, but there is nothing in the library that uh, essentially knows anything about any of those. Each of them is declared like in a separate header file and you can include whichever you like and you can replace any of those. So the guard pattern is what was when in OCaml. It's like, it's essentially when you say, okay, I want to bind to a variable, but I want to make sure it, the entire pattern will, will match only if, that, if the value of that variable is greater than seven. So you can put arbitrary conditions or I want to bind to x, but I want to make sure that that x is, is equal to y, which is exactly, uh, the short card for this is exactly as plus y. So this is the meaning of plus y. Uh, equivalence combinator, meaning uh, I don't want to uh, bind the value into the variable pattern. I want to use the value already in it as a value pattern. Uh, I chose plus to overload plus because uh, the plus, among other things, it turns L values into R values in uh, C++. And that kind of gives you the connotation that from L value, this became now an R value. And um, that's why plus, basically. But you, you, you have a limited choice of what you can overload in C++, and uh, you, you have to kind of play around with that. Uh, we, we have, of course, like all the logical uh, combinators of patterns, which match if both, like this pattern, we will talk about it, it's uh, algebraic decomposition. It will match only the, the numbers that are divisible by six. Um, you can combine them, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we have some C++-specific patterns, which are address and the reference patterns. And those are useful when, for example, you wanna, uh, you would like to, to uh, you have a, uh, your, your actual uh, subject is a pointer uh, to value, but you, would, you, you don't wanna do pattern matching on the pointer. You, wanna, you, you would like to do pattern matching on the actual value. And that's where the, the, the address pattern helps because it, it does exactly that and it checks that your argument is not null PTR and, uh, and then redirect it to the actual pattern, et cetera, et cetera. These are some, uh, we are working on some patterns, uh, this are some simple ones for like when you have to deal with containers, like uh, vectors, like STL containers or something. Uh, but there are some, some issues there too, and I'll try to talk about those. And uh, the main thing, so this is the actual, the canonical example of red, black tree balancing in our library. So you can totally do this. Uh, you, do, you have exactly the same recursive structure on four arguments. And um, these three dots here are just the same expression here. And it works uh, without having to write all those pages of code. Okay. The three patterns, like these constructor patterns, are not the only patterns you can do. So you can also uh, analyze and decompose the built-in types. And um, uh, constructor patterns were introduced like back in 69, I believe, by Rod Burstall. Uh, he, he, he introduced this uh, very nice syntax where he could decompose structural. It's, it's, you could, he, you, he, it facilitated the structural induction on the um, uh, uh, on some terms that he had in the in progress. So you could also prove along the way, and that's, how, that's why he introduced that. Uh, so people quickly realize that uh, it doesn't have to be structural induction. If you look at the piano representation of numbers, you can apply the same ideas to, uh, to numbers. And that's how Haskell got n plus k patterns, which, which were the patterns of the form n plus a constant. They got uh, abandoned because um, uh, there was no a clear agreement of how those patterns can be generalized to other uh, uh, expressions, not just to the expression of n plus k. Uh, we are not going to, to take a stand, you know, like where, uh, how the exactly semantics should be. It's, it's, uh, it's beyond the question. One of the generalizations of that approach was the equational uh, application patterns. Uh, and uh, the semantics was basically uh, the semantics of solving an equation, which is trivial when there is one solution, but it's not clear, again, like what, what if you have many solutions, et cetera, et cetera. So there are, there are questions there too. Uh, 
Instead, in, in Mach 7, we, uh, we treat uh, this as uh, notational patterns. So what we say is, OK, a lot of times we deal, for example, with rational numbers in our programs. Okay? And in, in mass, this is a notation for decomposing uh, a rational number into uh, denominator and uh, uh, forgot what the other part is called. Numerator, Numerator yes. Um, or some, like if you deal with, uh, you, you might decompose uh, some numbers into quotient and reminder. You know, like, uh, so this is just, oh, like the most known one is like, this is a, a typical representation of complex numbers and we immediately know what's the real part, what's the imaginary part. Uh, some, like, uh, these notational patterns, like they, they don't have to be, uh, and that's where they contradict the, this equational semantics, because your notation already can have the equation embedded in it. So think about an object that represents a line. You have different uh, representations of line in mass. Uh, you can have like slope intercept form, linear equation form, two point form, etc. Uh, you already have, in some of them, you already have the, the, uh, the equation sign embedded. Uh, and these forms are used in mathematics to essentially decompose the line into parts which you would like to use in the, in, in, in other, uh, essentially in, in the right-hand side. So we take this approach um, of, the notation, of notational patterns and we, we essentially let you uh, give semantics to your patterns and see uh, how, uh, uh, what, what you would like to, to give them. Okay, let me see how I'm doing on time. Okay, I have to to do a little bit faster. Uh, so this is an example of decomposing a, uh, an integer, essentially. So uh, this is a power algorithm. This is your typical how it's described in the book, the fast uh, uh, raising to power. This is how you do it in the Mach 7. It's uh, just a uh, uh, like a case analysis on your values, 0, 1, 1x. One now, this is uh, because we are dealing with the integer one, this will only match the even. Um, uh, the even numbers and in the right hand side the value of m will become n over 2. This case will, will my, match only the odd numbers and in the right hand side uh, the value of m will be n minus 1 over 2 which essentially gives you exactly the same notation as here. Any questions on this? Yes, Eric. So yes, I will be. So uh, uh, the question was, uh, how is it Im implemented? Does it uh, do expression templates? So yes, uh, I will talk essentially in like next two slides how it's implemented. So the patterns itself, they are expression templates, uh, and they build expression, uh, and then the LS. Specifically, this one, uh, we give essentially backward semantics to the expression templates. And uh, as far as we know, this is the first use case of expression templates where we don't give the traditionally forward semantics, where you just you build your expression and then you forward evaluate it or forward uh, analyze something. We give a backward semantics because it essentially solves equation this equals that. Question. In this case, uh, we know in the, what are the equations are you rich to uh, do uh, this kind of equational uh, reasoning in, in other cases? So, uh, uh, I will have a slide on that. Uh, we, we will, re uh, and it's kind of how, how this I implemented. Uh, the question was uh, wh whether this generalizes to other, uh, you know, like domains, not just for integers. Uh, so one thing I want to try, uh, want to say, we are not taking any stand on like how uh, you, uh, how n plus k patterns should be generalized. What we are saying is, you want to general like, if application patterns is the way you want to generalize them, we let you implement it because it still falls into the uh, in in notational uh, patterns approach. If you would like to implement it any other way, you can implement it any other way. The library is not hard coded to that. And, uh, uh, and, and, we and we will uh, see this. In this particular example, I just wanted to show we can implement this, uh, this uh, application patterns approach if you want to. Question. Um, so does this syntax support like such that, you know, that you have in Haskell, you know, where you put the bar and then you just give any kind of... Yes, that was the, the guard, the guard, uh, the guard uh, combinator here. The very first one, okay. that's the guard combinator. So it's... Uh, 
it's, it's just one kind of combinator you can implement. Uh, now, um, not the one uh, also important difference from the uh, functional world. Now, because our variable patterns uh, has to be explicitly introduced, we have types, okay? And we can use that fact to essentially do a smarter match. Like here, for example, because we have essentially unsigned type, uh, this expression a plus x, and a essentially becomes here a constant because it's a constant here, so it's, you can treat it as a constant va uh, a value pattern. This a plus x will only match if, uh, if essentially b greater than a. Does it make sense? So we can, we can use the fact, and, and we will see this uh, in other slides for the, for the patterns, we, we, we can use the fact that our variables now have type uh, to our advantage. But of course, there are disadvantages too. And we can do other patterns too. So you can, int you can totally introduce, you know, like uh, for, uh, there is a regular expression class now in, in C++ standard. It took me about 20 to 30 minutes to turn that regular expression class into regular expression pattern, which can be used to essentially bind subparts like I, this one bind uh, I mean we have a groups and then like we have the sub patterns matching those groups so this essentially recognizes any toll free phone number or we can save these patterns into variables which is essentially the same as, as we do the expression so we can say that the month pattern is, is, any, is uh, a variable pattern uh, that has to be greater than zero and less than 13 and then we can use that pattern reuse in several places uh, or we can spell it out explicitly if we want to, etc. Uh, so the main point of this slide is all patterns in this library are user definable, and uh, you can save them as, as variables and pass around in functions. Okay, so um, if you uh, like, how now I'll try to convince you it's actually uh, efficient, and uh, you can use it in in realistic applications. Uh, so if we were to design this feature from, from scratch, like when we started, we were, we, we were trying to look what actually, uh, what kind of interactions between patterns and subjects can you do. So you can, in other, and this is not exactly a particular language because this one is not specifically available neither in Camel or Haskell, but just treat it kind of in broadly. Uh, so you can group by subjects multiple patterns, okay? You can check the exact structure, so it's a it has to be exactly a list of three values. Uh, you can introduce and bind variables. You can compose patterns with uh, uh, combinators. You can structurally decompose them through constructors, etc. You can algebraically decompose it like we just saw in the previous examples. You can restrict them through guards uh, to apply additional uh, and perform actions. It's always nice to have, um, uh, like if, if your compiler would be able to do either type inference or type checking of the patterns, nice of course to have openness towards patterns and combinators and towards the user defined types. Uh, it's nice if you can do the different algebraic data types and codings. Uh, we expect compiler to generate efficient uh, decision procedure. Uh, redundancy checking is important. Exhaustiveness checking is uh, another uh, important thing that we get. Um, so extensive annotation, we get most of these, not all of them. Like exhaustiveness is still a question and uh, we don't get implicit variable introductions. Okay, so how uh, this uh, whole thing works. So the idea of patterns as objects has been there for a while. Uh, the, the main idea is essentially you have a, a, an object class hierarchy, which gives you some sort of value semantics, and then you have a pattern uh, hierarchy. And uh, the pattern has a virtual function match that uh, essentially uh, takes the object, and then you can implement it in different ways on different classes. Uh, the advantage of this is the main advantage is you can compose these patterns at runtime based on essentially user input. Okay, user can type uh, patterns in you know uh, from keyboard, and you can construct your patterns. You can still get open patterns, they have first class, you get dynamic composition, but it's intrusive because now you suddenly have to stock these uh, virtual functions. You get type errors at random and like the reason almost nobody uses it, it's extremely slow because of the virtual function calls and because of the heap allocations that you will have to, to do, etc., etc. So the approach we follow is patterns as expression templates. So we compose these patterns as at compile time, okay? So um, 
the disadvantage, of course, we don't get the uh, runtime composition, but we still get most of the advantages. And in most of the languages, patterns are hard coded into the language. So essentially, we are not worse than all, all those languages. So we are probably worse than some of the scripting languages where you can compose them, you know, essentially from. But we are we are not worse than most of the other languages, and we are still open to, uh, towards patterns. Uh, we are first class, non-intrusive, and we get uh, type most of the type errors at compile time. The idea is uh, so. The pattern can take sub patterns as arguments, and uh, that's why the, the constructor. And uh, the, the, these patterns are usually temporary objects, so you will, they will essentially get moved in uh, through your move constructor, so you, you almost pay nothing there. Okay? Uh, they, they, they are very efficient and everything. And then, like, instead of match operator, we, we, uh, we use the, uh, the application operator because we, we want to, to use them as a pr typical predicate tool. And uh, so you essentially uh, uh, have to define the application operator. More specifically, so there are two kind, like there are uh, the objects in the library. They they follow two concepts, okay? And this is kind of like not not exactly the notations from concept flight, but it's kind of the some incarnation of it when I was uh, still uh, and Andrew was still working on it back in A and M. Uh, so the patterns uh, have to be copyable. Uh, they have to explicitly state that they are patterned by specializing this trait pattern. Okay? They should have application operator uh, with result convertible to bool. Uh, and there should be a type function uh, called accepted type, which is given a pattern, this pattern, and given a subject type, returns a type that will be expected. It's a detail that I will talk. Now, uh, there is another uh, concept that object follows is a lazy expression, and that's essentially to be able to compose the the expression templates and be able to evaluate them. So here it's essentially the same thing. They have to explicitly state it through traits. Uh, there should be evaluation functions that can evaluate them once they are uh, used on the right-hand side, and they should be essentially convertible to the result type. OK, um, so how do, uh, some examples of implementation. So how do we implement the wildcard pattern to, to model that concept? Uh, wildcard accept anything, so we just uh, say, okay, for any type T, whatever that type T is, always return true. There's implementation of our wildcard pattern. Value pattern, uh, we parameterize it on the actual value, uh, and then we say, okay, uh, it matches if the stored value is equal to subject. Okay? That's the implementation of the value pattern. Variable pattern. Uh, so we store the, uh, the uh, we keep the, the values that we are going to bind inside the variable pattern, uh, and so the semantics say okay, assign that value. Okay, it's actually mutable here because here it's const, uh, but that's an implementation detail, and just return true. Now, what if the type is different, the subject type is different, like here? Well, in general case, we might say okay, try to convert it, but if the conversion doesn't preserve the value, just make sure uh, they still compare equal. And I know there is a lot of like generic programming issues here. That's one of the ways we can implement it and we can discuss about you know, the value semantics and, uh, here. Now, how would we implement uh, essentially uh, uh, constructor patterns? So the, as I said, the user defines binding by specializing, the, specializing this binding class for his uh, class. And he, he does it in the following way. He says, like, bind this, for example, for value, uh, as we see. After these members is essentially a, a variadic macro that after substitution results in something like this. So it, uh, I mean, this can be parameterized over n if you want to be, like, really generic. But for simplicity, I just kept them directly in the name. Uh, and it essentially generates this code, which generates these functions, which returns pointers to members, OK? What it gives us essentially, it gives us an access to the, to the pointer by position, okay? And there is, uh, the library has this uh, overloaded function apply member, which given a, a, a subject and given, a, let's say we want to apply second member, it will call that and then we'll apply. And it's of course overloaded on data members, uh, you know, like uh, getters, setters, whatever your combination, freestanding functions, whatever, whatever, whatever you, you can typically provide there. Uh, so now uh, the implementation of our constructor patterns, uh, and, and of course you can you can do this through variadics. Uh, just for simplicity, I do this here for two sub patterns. So we, we store sub patterns directly inside us. 
Uh, okay, I, co I copied here the copy constructor. Essentially, there is move constructor, but there are some issues with variables. So, I mean, I'm not going to, to go into those details. Uh, the implementation of the operate the matching essential operator, we are going to say, okay, extract from from this subject, which is T, extract the first binding member, okay, and try to match the first sub pattern with that member. Do the same for the second one. And if both of them match, then the entire constructor pattern match. So this is a generic expression of what the constructor pattern on two arguments would look like, regardless of what the actual patterns are. This is where your, your composition is coming. Uh, now, if the type is different, there are options here. Okay? And uh, if the, uh, if the, typically, uh, think about this as the case we saw with, with the terms and uh, plus uh, values. The static type, the, the T can be, for example, term, okay? And, but we are trying to match uh, against like value. So essentially, U will be term here, but T will be like plus or something. So we essentially wanna, in those cases, we wanna do dynamic cost, okay? Which can be expensive. Uh, the, uh, uh, of course, uh, it makes sense to enable if it only if we are dealing with polymorphic classes. If it's not polymorphic classes, we can do some other logic. But that's already up to, to particular implementation of the pattern. And then we have this shortcut to be able to just say C, uh, to turn a, a type into a constructor pattern. Okay, so now uh, back to your question, how the algebraic decomposition is implemented. Um, and I should um, uh, speed up this. Uh, so, this is a, a binary operation, okay? We here assert that both sub-arguments should be essentially lazy expressions. Uh, we have result type that is computed through some uh, thing. Uh, the expected type is the result type. Uh, we need this one to be able to use this expression in the right-hand side as a, as a value, essentially. So we just evaluate it. And then uh, the most imp interesting part is we just call a generic function solve. We say, okay, solve uh, this pattern with respect to this subject, okay? That's what it does in general case. Now, solve is, is where the real magic happens. So in general case, solve just says that for Elliot, uh, and I use this uh, uh, notation from, um, from concept slide, but in the real implementation, you will have a bunch of enable ifs, and et cetera. So just treat it as such. In, in the default implementation, we just say, hey, you did not provide a solver. So you will, you will get, if you, if you try to decompose something you didn't provide solvers for, you will get a nice error message. Now, uh, back to your question, uh, like what if we don't have like an integer? So let's say we have field, okay? And field has a, has a division, okay? So we can say, okay, when we, when we have a field and we have an expression of the form, essentially multiplication of some expression by a constant, okay? And we are matching it against result type, we just have to solve it because the, the division exists with respect to res, uh, result divided by the evaluation on that constant. And ME2 will be that con constant essentially. And uh, recursively solve that, okay? And that makes it work, you know, like through, through kind of pass it further. Now we can say that if we have an integral, uh, if, if the, the actual uh, result type models uh, an integral concept, so we have some sort of integer type, it's not exactly, we don't have the, the, the unique division, so we are going to do some, something else. We are going to evaluate that constant, we still bind the same expression, uh, which is generic with respect to E. We, we are going to evaluate that constant, but then we are going to check, okay, if the constant uh, fully divides the result, then we solve it, otherwise we just report false. And this is the entire implementation to make that uh, match statement I showed you with 2m and 2m plus 1 work. Essentially, you don't even need this. Just this one is what makes that 2m and 2m plus 1 work. And, and you, can, you, can, uh, you can generalize, you can decompose complex numbers like this. You know, like you'll have to play around more. Of course, you will have to, a lot of overload resolution issues kind of uh, that you will have to take care of. But you can essentially express quite complex uh, decompositions. Okay, so what can we do so far? Uh, we can explicitly declare primitives, uh, decompose uh, objects into parts, uh, nest patterns, uh, and then like we have somewhat lame uh, syntax because we have to 
create pattern and explicit, implicit, uh, explicitly apply it. Create, apply, create, apply, which is kind of lame. But we can see that like the pattern happens only here once, and this can be actually ex the boilerplate can be extracted into macros. So we can ex essentially macroize this, where expression happens only one, and we get this nice structure, okay, which is kind of closer to what the syntax you've seen. Nice syntax, but slow. It essentially evaluates them sequentially, right? Uh, and uh, why it's slow? Uh, sequential execution, so we always try them one by one. If it involves dynamic costs, like this, uh, you know, uh, constructor patterns, it's even worse because that, that's, a, that's a huge cost right there. Uh, initiate tons of temporaries, uh, yes and no. Uh, as I said, these are expression templates. Most of the time, they are moved in through mo constructors, so you almost don't get much overhead of this. Okay, uh, compilers is actually quite good if you really get this question. It's quite good in getting this. Like the first time I uh, I implemented uh, uh, I think power algorithm, and then I was running it against my handcraft implement. My power algorithm was faster, and I was like, hmm, why is my handcrafted slower? So, so there is no like much uh, of you know like magic going on. There is no really uh, there is no really hard uh, template meta programming going on. So the instantiation is just like top bottom. There is no really uh, you know anything complicated going on. So so it's very easy to to uh, to optimize and compilers kind of deal with, with are ready to deal with with this uh, these days. And I'll show some um, numbers on that. Um, so. The bigger problem is, and it's hard to avoid in a, in a, in a library setting, if you have certain sub-expression in several places, the same sub-patterns that is in the same position for the subject, you essentially rematch it several times. And that's where, in a compiler solution, the compiler will typically just do it once. So the compiler will generate a decision procedure which will, which will touch each subject or like, it will do the minimum number of, of checks, essentially. We cannot do that, but it's, it still gives us a reason, reasonable uh, uh, thing. It does not check redundancy. Yes and no. Uh, I'll show that even in the library settings, we can do redundancy checking on one argument in some cases, and we actually do. Uh, and I have some ideas there how to, to generalize it. Uh, exhaustiveness, not so, not so do. Because the set of classes open, your classes can come up with from dynamically linked libraries. You never can assume that you've seen the entire set of classes. So unless your match statement has otherwise, you can never assume you, are, you have exhaustive uh, check because you can always add a new class derived from, from, the, from the base class. Composition makes sense. You, you, you saw that I, I sprinkle around the static uh, 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 asserts. So whatever we can check, we do check. Whatever we cannot, well, it's, uh, uh, hopefully we'll be checked in the compiler. And what if we don't use polymorphic classes, which is like what we want to use uh, boost variant. Okay, so here's the first optimization. So can we optimize this uh, without actually uh, having to assume the, what the, the patterns do? And um, the, the problem is that every time we go and evaluate them, we don't, we don't remember, we don't learn from it. So if, uh, let's generalize it a little bit. Let's say we have a predicate PI, uh, and we just want to check, we just want to match that argument and jump the, uh, to the first predicate that matches, okay? Uh, turns out, like, you can, uh, the idea is, like, we can memoize that we matched, for example, on, on sevens, and then next time we come with the X, we just jump directly to, to, to seven again. We don't want to re-evaluate it. And that, of course, assumes functional behavior that you don't have any side effects, etc. So it turns out uh, this, this structure can be encoded in C++ uh, in the library, and that's essentially uh, a trick uh, you can use in other libraries too. Uh, we invented this device. Of course, we got uh, uh, kind of inspired by Duff's device. But the idea is the following. We, we store, a, let's say, a hash map that maps values to the jump labels, okay? And then by default, uh, there is no labels, no, no mapping. So uh, every time you access it, there is nothing. It, it, uh, it allocates zero because it's int over there, size t. So we jump into default and we start a sequential execution of that, um, of that statement, okay? Let's say if the first one or seventh one succeed, we start executing it. So we, we write to that uh, reference one because we, we want to remember that for one first and that L is bound to wherever, wherever we are. So next time we come with the same value, 
we will not jump anymore to here. We will jump to directly here and we will execute that statement. Does that make sense? This is totally legit C++. And uh, you can use this trick for a lot of other things. So the first time around, you execute it sequentially until the first one that succeeds. If it doesn't succeed, uh, case n plus 1, which is here, we remember that, that none of them succeeded, so we, we jump directly to case n plus 1, so we don't have to execute them. Any question about this? Because this is in, in kind of important. Uh, that the, the type switch that I will show how it makes the stuff uh, efficient is based on this, in part. Of course, the biggest disadvantage of this, this grows with the, with the, with the number of values you've seen. Okay? And of course, in such a form, it's not useful, okay? because you can have millions of values coming through it. But we will see later, and uh, that's how it's used in the type switch, a lot of times these values can be grouped into equivalence classes. And instead of storing actually the value, you can store the equivalence class. And you may have a limited set of equivalence classes. Okay? In terms of type switch, you can think your equivalence class is a type. Okay? Because that will essentially uh, will jump to, to wherever you, the first type you are. And there are some, some details there, how to handle multiple inheritance, etc. Uh, how to do the this point, pointer adjustment. But we will, we, if, if you have time, we will touch it. Otherwise, I'll leave it question. Uh, whatever you want, it's a statement. It's a uh, how, how many? Oh, uh, the, que the question uh, was what's S1, S2, Sn. It's essentially whatever statements you want to put there. Yes and no. Uh, in when we generate this from essentially that match and match, we put we put uh, like we start this one with bra braces. So uh, essentially, we 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 introduce a scope there. Any other question? Okay. So memoization device, use it. I'm sure there is a lot of other places you can use it. Now, we you think we had a lot of essentially uh, workarounds, like why why we are still have to. Uh, why we just don't have type switch in C++? Turns out it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's quite a, a challenge in general. Um, there is something what's called expression problem. So um, I'll just give you a very brief look at it. Uh, so the same uh, thing we had, the same grammar, the same expression language. Uh, algebraic data type on the left-hand side, classes on the right-hand side. Note that uh, algebraic data types are closed and disjoint. So we can do recursive uh, structure. To do the same in object-oriented world, we have to stick here a virtual function and then override that virtual function in each of the cases. The following observation is, in the functional world, it's very easy to add new functions because you just essentially add a new function that does the case analysis. But it's very difficult to add new variants because you have to change the algebraic data types and you have to change all existing functions. Okay, the situation is the opposite, the dual in the object-oriented world. It's very easy to add new variants because you just essentially add new derived class, but it's very uh, difficult to add new functions because you have to stick new virtual functions and change all the existing uh, uh, classes. This duality is what's called the expression problem, and um, people try to solve. Uh, this is kind of repeats that the properties of this, of course, we, which we already mentioned. Uh, sorry, um, elegant, intuitive, etc. Uh, the what's called uh, object-oriented decomposition in the literature. What we saw with the virtual functions, y the pros you get modularity encapsulation, the typical object-oriented stuff you get. Okay, uh, you can do, uh, deal with multiple inherent dynamic linking and, su and such. You don't get extensibility of functions easily. There is no local reason. Your virtual functions can be different files, different DLLs, etc. And it's inherently non-relational. Like you cannot have this relation. And this is uh, the situation is quite the opposite there. So I'm going to kind of rush through here to show you some. Um, now, as I said, uh, this this polymorphic encoding where we have the virtual functions and we use dynamic cast to analyze. It's just one encoding. And that in the literature, it's called polymorphic encoding of algebraic data types. There are others. There are, it has pros and cons. Uh, I will skip those. It's extremely slow, which is, which is important. Um, 
the tag encoding is when essentially your base class already has a tag and that tag uniquely identifies which derived class you have and you allocate some numbers to it. And you can essentially do the, the, the switch statement to analyze, but note here, there is no substitutability. Like if you have a, 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 a super plus derived from plus, which will have of course a different tag, that different tag will not jump to the plus here, okay? Which is, so, so you don't get by default substitutability. There is a way to do substitutability and, and that's something we do, in, we let you do in the library too. So Niklaus Wirt, he, at some point, he, he invented a way how you can do li linearization of uh, class hierarchy. You can essentially say, my class, this is the list of my base class, next base class, next base class, and you, you linearize them in chain. So you try, the, you try the tag, and if it didn't succeed, you retry the next one, the next one, the next one. So you, in that way, you get a limited form of substitutability. And we support that in the library too. So the, the, main, the main thing to take out of here, we support all of these encodings uh, to a limited extent. And I'll have a slide on that. Uh, the, they have pros and cons, and I will mention it. Of course, uh, the typical one is also discriminated union encoding, where you don't use I mean, essentially different uh, the right classes. You use you use a discriminated union and also a tag, and uh, it also it has even more issues. It's even harder to do a substitutability here. Um, not type safe at all. Now, to combine these two walls, people invented this design pattern. They wanted to have Bo uh, the better of the two. They wanted to be able to introduce new functions and new classes. And uh, visitor design pattern is extremely fast. Uh, it just involves two virtual functions uh, call. Uh, it gives you some sort of extensibility of functions. Almost, it's a library solution, so you don't have to. You don't need compiler support. But extremely hard to teach, intrusive, because you have to essentially change your base class with this. You know, like uh, accept, etc. Specific to class hierarchy, because this will be specific to class hierarchy, uh, your vis visitation interface, you have to write a lot of boilerplate codes. There is control inversion. So if you don't do your recur recursive uh, calls directly, you have to save your state, get your state, save result, return result, which is kind of pain, and which is kind of what makes it hard to teach, I guess, the student. Most importantly, it hinders extensibility of classes. Note that if we have a super plus derived from plus somewhere in some DLL, it will only be recognizable as plus. So we cannot distinguish that it was super plus. There are uh, ways in the literature to do a little bit better, but they are not like fully, like there are tricks and they are either not type safe or they are slow, but still kind of, you, you cannot get the full uh, real extensibility of functions with visitors. And this is the amount of boilerplate code you have to write just to uh, implement that uh, eval function. Now there is a, a, another way, clever way people did, which is called polymorph polymorphic exception idiom. And it's a, another way to do visitor design pattern. You essentially introduce a, a race function. Okay, this is wrong, yes. But people, people discuss that. Uh, and the race function throws itself. Okay, and then you use try catch, essentially, uh, to catch whatever you are. Okay, the, the only reason I provide this slide is because there was a lot of talks in the functional community how to handle open cases, like, like when your classes are open. And one of the suggestions was we can use the same uh, mechanism we use for exceptions in, uh, in functional languages. On the next, sli on the next uh, slide, you will see why it's not a good idea. Oops. Wait. Okay, this is... Uh, so the library essentially lets you uh, support whatever encoding you want, but this encoding are not equivalent. So um, this, uh, the actual type switch that, that is, uh, it, it has all the nice features, it, it does substitutability, it can be on multiple arguments, it generalizes to multiple arguments. Uh, what's repeat case, like you cannot reuse visitors, for example, if you have the top level pattern is of type plus, 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 because then you have to somehow make sure you combine them. And th in the library, it, it's, it's not easy to, it's of course easy to do it in compiler, but not easy to, to. so. Tag switch, tag switch pr plus virtual really linearization, they kind of, uh, it gives you substitutability but doesn't give you relational or doesn't give you this uh, repeated case, etc. So they have disadvantages. So the only real one that we uh, kind of like, we suggest that you always use is the polymorphic encoding because it has the, the largest support and it's, it's super fast. And um, in the remaining time, I'll try to really convince you. So as, we, as I mentioned, 
Uh, what's the problem? Why we don't have a type switch, efficient type switch? Because classes is extensible. Like you can have new classes arriving from dynamic link libraries, and they are hierarchical. There is no this disjointness, uh, disjointness properties that you have in the algebraic data type class. So your super plus has to match against plus. You have to have substitutability, and you can't get around with that. Um, now, multiple with multiple inheritors, you, you open a whole can of worms. You, you have up, down, cross cast. Uh, the cast is not a no-op, like, like, which is an assumption in a lot of uh, uh, type case uh, kind of implementations in the other languages. Uh, you can have ambiguities, even uh, you know, like when um, it, it's, it's a lot of things. So the existing approaches, like the efficient approaches, they usually assume closed world, easy, easy case, because then you allocate from zero to n tags and you do your, your jump table implementation. And that's super efficient, but it of course doesn't handle the open case. Uh, so it's unrealistic for modern C++. The open world, the, the most uh, typical implementation in the open world case is uh, you use some sort of constant time subtype test, which is like constant type uh, dynamic cast, uh, and decision trees. Now, you remember the very first implementation we had like was, uh, okay, it's actually on the next slide. So if you wanted to implement some sort of type switch, the most easiest open implementation would be just to generate this kind of nested if statement. If dynamic cast to the first one, if dynamic cast to the second one, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it, it does work with uh, objects coming from DLLs. It does, does work with multiple inheritance in the way you would expect the same semantics as dynamic cast. The problem is it's super slow. Like this is the number of cases, like if n is 100, like here, this is the amount of time it takes to, to, to reach the hundreds case. It's like 22,000 cycles in, on the typical implementation. Uh, even if your compiler will optimize it with decision trees, because you don't have to just linearly check, you can eliminate certain things. Assuming like a perfect binary kind of binary tree class hierarchy, you are still, you know, like spending on an average like 5,000 cycles on, on, on that. Now, this is how much you would spend with polymorphic exception idiom. And, and don't treat this wrong. Exceptions are extremely fast in modern implementation of C++ when you use them for exceptional cases. Here, we use them for a common case. That's why it's extremely slow. We essentially use it as a control flow structure, and you should never do that. So only use exceptions for, for, for real exceptional cases. And, and that's why like the, the suggestions in the functional world that maybe we can use the same mechanism as exceptions to handle the open case. Um, I'm not sure their, their implementation of exceptions is better than in C++. Now, the whole problem with this, this is where visitor design pattern is. It's, it's right around 20 cycles if we do repeat case. Mo most importantly, it doesn't depend which one you, you dispatch. It's flat. Okay, uh, now this is kind of this is a repetitive case on uh, multiple things. Uh, if you do a random case with visitors, this will kind of pop up here to around 54, but it still will be flat. Okay, uh, now if you take some of the existing like constant type uh, instance of implementations, which is the Cohen's algorithm, binary matrix, even them with the with the decision tree implementation, even them they grow first of all, so they are not flat. And even, even them uh, implement uh, uh, very quickly surpass visitors. Note that this one don't support uh, multiple inheritance. The first case that supported in a way, which was fast dynamic cast, like Dr. Strauss, Troop, and Michael, um, forgot, uh, I forgot the name. They did the paper on it. This one handles multiple inheritance. It has its own limitations. But you can see, like, just to be able to handle multiple inheritance, you already go like way further while your visitors are here. Now, this is as, as good as you can do like an implementation on, on, the, on the closed tags from zero to n, a jump table essentially. This is where our open type switch is. It's flat, it's amortized flat. So on the first k, on the first uh, with a given type, you will still spend the, the, the long run because you will have to figure out which, which is the first one that succeeds. But after that, it's flat, okay? Questions on this? No. So I'm going to skip the implementation of the actual type switch to, uh, uh, to the, if you will have questions. We, we have a papers on those, and uh, I'll just kind of show you the performance results just to convince you, oops, what happened? Uh, just to convince you it's usable. Uh, okay, so 
here's uh, how it compares to, uh, so the numbers in blue uh, when the type switch is faster than the visitor uh, design pattern by corresponding percentage points, the numbers in red uh, when the visitor design pattern is uh, better than, uh, than type switch by corresponding percentage point. We tried it on several uh, different uh, compilers, uh, GC, Visual, C++, uh, several different configurations and operating systems and stuff. And um, uh, this, is, this was the, uh, what's called, the configuration which we tried. Uh, the truly open case, you can see that uh, most of the time we are faster a little bit. In the cases we, when we are not fa when we are slower, we are not slower by much. Okay. Now, if we add the support of those other like tag encodings, etc., where we let, which we also let you do in the library, which have their own restrictions, like uh, like you can only do them on one argument, for example, you cannot do them on multiple arguments, which we discussed. You get like much bigger, uh, you know. Uh, uh, advantage with the type switch, but of course you you don't get all of the flexibility. Now uh, this is like once you go from one argument to several arguments, like like double, triple, or, or quadruple dispatch, like the type switch becomes significantly better than visitors. So the red ones are the visitors. This is like single argument visitor, two argument with. Uh, I mean like double dispatch, triple dispatch, quadruple dispatch. And this is for comparison, we had some time ago a uh, compiler implementation of multi-methods in C++. So that's, that's almost as fast as you can go. So the type switch doesn't give you exactly that, uh, but given that it's kind of open and stuff, it still does better than, uh, than uh, visitors for multiple arguments. So that's your advantage right there. Uh, this is how it compares also to other languages. This is the open case. It's a little bit slower than the Haskell. Haskell actually should be around here. Uh, they, like people pointed out, there was you could optimize the code we used for for comparing this, like with some tricks I don't really understand. But yes, the Haskell case can drop to around the same as here. But still, the idea is it's in the same ballpark. It's not anymore the thousands of cycles that you are spending. Uh, we tested it on a lot of class hierarchies. Uh, there was uh, about 63,000, uh, uh, 15,000 classes, 63,000 class hierarchies. These are some details I will skip. Uh, I will leave it to the paper. Um, as I said, like the pattern matching mechanisms, uh, the, the mechanism uh, interacts with the type switch to give you that speed. So the actual decomposition of a pattern is slow. That's where your expression templates are. But the type switch is where you gain most of the performance. Uh, and what, what makes it fast. And uh, so the pattern can expose, so instead of saying, hey, I, I expect term as my subject, you can say I expect plus as my subject. So type switch will immediately bring the most specific type for it so that the pattern can start accepting that already uh, more specialized type. Okay, so that's where you gain performance. Um, and there are details on how exactly we do that. Uh, th those markers, they generate essentially a lot of code. This is uh, just to show you, uh, we implemented few like very, very simple examples like factorial, Fibonacci, GCD, lambda, lambda calculator and power function using our uh, patterns and using that pattern as object approach uh, that was with virtual functions. You can see the typical overhead with, with the uh, patterns as object approach is like in, in uh, hundreds if not thousands of percent, the overhead. Okay, and these are very simple uh, cases. Like, the typical overhead uh, of our approach, even uh, this like factorial Fibonacci, they don't have any, uh, any type switching going on. So they're they are quite small, okay? While in Visual C++, we, I guess, it didn't optimize that well, but like in some cases we actually were faster, which is these uh, uh, numbers. Well, with, la with lambdas it was faster, of course, because of the type switch. Here uh, it was, the compiler just had a better chance for, for optimizing. But that gives you an idea, okay, you can still use this solution. It doesn't give you too much overhead in comparison to your handcrafted stuff, but it gives you the, the, the expression. This one, it's kind of too costly. Several people expressed concerns that this can have like a negative impact on the compile times. It doesn't. Actually, neither that one nor this one has any impact on the compile time. Uh, so we compared those and uh, there is no, as I said, there is no really template ma like complicated template metaprogramming going on. It's just straightforward implement, uh, instantiation of expression templates. So it's very, very straightforward. So, so your, your increase in compile time is, is ne negligible. Now, 
We did re-implement uh, existing applications that use like visitors using this pattern matching approach. And in this application, uh, there is this framework pivot that we did in Texas A&M. We re-implemented pretty printer uh, for it's a C++ pretty printer. It, uh, it takes in a C++ program, spits out C++ program. Okay, and we tried this for speed. So as an input, we fed to that C++ pretty printer the standard headers from Visual C++, I, I, I believe. Uh, and, and of course, the smaller the header, the less nodes you have in the abstract syntax tree, right? So you can see, the, this, and here roughly the number of line of code will be proportional to the number of nodes in the uh, abstract syntax tree. So the less of the uh, line of, uh, essentially, nodes in the abstract syntax tree, the visitors were still better, okay? But as soon as we cross something like 144 lines of code, already pattern matching started becoming better, okay? Here we're still kind of like saying, and then as soon as we cross like around one, like 1,000 lines of code for a standard header is nothing. So you can assume that most of your headers will already include that, okay? So you can see that after that, the pattern matching is essentially faster than your visitor's implementation. Okay, and it doesn't use much memory either. Actually, this graph is still for the old implementation of the data structure that is used underneath for type switching. But even on that old data structure, uh, this was the, the largest case uh, statement which, which had 15 case clauses and uh, 80 different sub-objects uh, because there was multiple inheritance uh, coming through it. And you can see uh, not only multiple inheritance but also several deri uh, derived classes. You can see in the worst case it was like 2,500 uh, 2, bytes. Okay, just to maintain that that uh, that uh, fast type uh, type switching. In the in the harder case where you had um, 52 case clauses, but you had uh, also less uh, subobjects. Sorry, 63 case clauses, but less subobjects. You had even less memory. So it's also memory efficient, and uh, you don't get to. Now I would like to come back to something that uh, the Chandler uh, touched uh, yesterday, and I think Eric will also talk about. So there is a problem, a little bit of problem with STL containers. Um, I think I should be good with, with uh, five minutes. Uh, so STL containers are not recursive data structures. Like they are not expressed in terms of themselves, okay? Ranges per se, they're also not recursive data structures because they're not, they're not quite, uh, especially if you start using the expression templates like, uh, like Chandler was, I'm, I'm not sure why Chandler was not calling them expression templates, but anyway. Uh, uh, like if you start building them, like they're still kind of not exactly in terms of themselves because they're always in terms of a different range. Uh, but the important thing about ranges, they can represent subparts of themselves. So they can, like in the same uh, type, you can have a represent a sub, sub subset of values of that same type. And in that way, you can decrease the complexity and recursively call on itself. So the problem will become more uh, easier on this example. So. Uh, I was trying to implement some, some simple kind of like prolog uh, interpreter, uh, which I didn't finish, but I at least had the, the basic structures. And uh, there are several different, uh, you know, term kinds in the prolog interpreter. W one of them is least, another is uh, structure. Least is a typical uh, recursive data structure because it has a hat and a recursive list, okay? And th that's your, your favorite functional thing. And pattern matching on this, we, we all, again, like let's say we implement the same equality. It's perfect. Like we say it's match hat, the same hat, match tail, the same tail. Or uh, they are both null PTRs, match null PTRs. It's not the case for the, the structure has a vector in it. It has a vector in it. And the, we cannot represent part of the vector as the vector itself without having to copy everything. Okay, and that copying will, will essentially kill performance. So this is commented out because this is not supported. This is something I'm looking, uh, looking at and I'm trying to, uh, to come up with. I'm looking also at other languages that have patterns that deal with sequences. And I'm trying to come up with some uh, patterns that can express essentially deal with sequences, deal with, with containers, etc. This is kind of my, my closest shot at it, what I would like it to look at, but it has a problem by itself because a range of what? Uh, rain, like, remember, like we have to explicitly declare variables here, so so we cannot anymore like with ranges implicitly deduce what its range of. So so it, I'm not sure how exactly it will look at, but this is kind of an open problem. But I think ranges is a, also a way. It's a right direction from the point of view of uh, pattern matching because ranges are 
even though they are not formally recursive data structures, they, they can be expressed in terms of themselves and, and you can recurse on them, and which is a really nice property, which, which is, I fully support ranges. So a few conclusions. Um, our, the, what I presented is open with respect to patterns and classes. Uh, faster than alternatives, visitors, uh, it's non-intrusive, like nowhere I had to inject something in the class hierarchy. The libraries that we present is a library solution. Um, it's open source under BSD license. Uh, this is where it will eventually leave. I was planning to kind of release it by today, but uh, I already kind of imported from our old Texas A&M repository, and I'm trying to move it here. This is where it will eventually be. It, it's SEL. It stands for Semantically Enhanced Library Languages. Dr. Straustrup had a paper about that, which I, I think is a really cool idea. So, so this is kind of going to be like an umbrella for several projects. Pattern matching is one of them. But like we, uh, we would like to look at some other ways of you know like dealing with uh, uh, like lang kind of language extensions inside the, the C++ itself. So so it will live eventually here. Right now you can uh, uh, tells me that my time is done. I'm done actually. Uh, right now you can download not polished code here. It works with Visual C++ uh, 2010 plus and GCC 4.4 Somebody told me there is some compilation problem in 4.8. I compiled, last time I compiled it was 4.7 GCC. Uh, so if you have 4.8, they said it's pretty easy to fix. Uh, I will try to look it, uh, look soon and kind of fix it uh, and put everything on that page. Uh, the library is released under BSD license. Actually, before we left Texas A&M, uh, we signed with A&M everything that it's going to be available under BSD. So you can, you can use it in your projects uh, without any problems. Um, there is some ongoing work. The, f the most, like it's kind of in terms of requests. The most requested thing is like people ask, like right now, like there are issues with Clang. It doesn't compile with Clang. So people ask you to support, uh, to fix the support. I, 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 I'm looking into that. Uh, the thing I'm, I'm, I've been working uh, on is log-free implementation of the data structures. Data structures that is used uh, for uh, efficient type switching. Right now, essentially, if you want to use it uh, as is, the libraries that you will download from there in the multi-thread applications, it's not thread safe. Don't do that. Okay. Like once I finish this one, and I'm I'm kind of debugging through this, so I have most of the implementation. I, I just have to make sure it works. Um, and uh, once that one is uh, available, like you should be able to use it in in multi-thread. The second most requested feature was like provide bindings or like provide some sort of thing for boost variant. Uh, we actually had a, a someone from um, Denmark, I believe, uh, trying to use our library for, for like Java analyzer or something. And uh, he wanted to use boost variant and he was uh, requesting. Sequence patterns, uh, as I showed on the previous slide, is something I look at. Um, um, I try to improve type checking so that you, you get less and less exposed to the internals of the library, but you get like a more reasonable static assert uh, that tells you actually what, what happens. Uh, diagnostic, etc. Uh, there is, uh, it benefits from C++11. Um, you know, like mo especially Moo constructors make it more efficient. Uh, uh, the varietics can, can reuse. But there is nothing specifically about uh, C++11 that is required for this implementation. So I'm trying to actually push uh, down the implementation also to support older compilers. Uh, so people can, can use this library. In the future, uh, I would like to, I, I have some ideas about more generic redundancy checking that will not be, oh, I actually forgot to, to to mention, because the library supports with that syntactic structure match, uh, case, and match, all those different encodings, essentially you can just switch a compile time switch. And there is one even that can do it like through generic metaprogramming. It will detect what kind of encoding you are using among few of them. And it will use the appro appropriate uh, you know, implementation of, that, of those macros. So, so uh, uh, the well, I want to say, like, uh, even though like, by default we don't have redundancy checking, but in, in that implementation of C++ Pretty Printer, it was uh, extremely needed because like, the, the, the visitors was uh, always listed like the most uh, base class first and derived class last. And there was like 160 of them, so it was very hard to figure out which ones are, are in the wrong order. So you can flip in the library essentially a, a compile time switch. It generates, instead of the type switch, it generates a try catch. Then you get like errors from the compiler saying like, "Hey, you have this. Uh, uh, you have like a more more general case before the more specific case." But of course, that only works with uh, with one argument, which was sufficient for our purposes, but doesn't generalize. So 
is in this in this work I'm trying to do it more general where I don't have to use the hack with uh, with the with the try catch it will be more with template meta programming and I think I can do better there um, then it's nice if we can uh, but this is already more related to the language feature we would like to to to, to deal with uh, generic implication because the, com the, 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 the challenge for the compiler implementation will be how do we generate the decision procedure without, many, without making any assumption about the, what the pattern actually does. Because the, the way you can generate this efficiently in other languages is because the compiler knows the semantic of a particular pattern. Here we want to keep the set of patterns open so the compiler cannot make any assumptions. And to be able to do that, we need to, to, to have some sort of implication relationship between patterns which should be available to the compilers. And I would like to look at two-way matching, the kind of uh, matching you have in Prolog, which is not just one way like, like in most of the pattern matching. And of course, uh, I'm, I'm now uh, a kind of, I, I work for, for Microsoft in Visual C++ Frontend, so uh, the idea is to eventually try it as a language feature in the compiler. Uh, there are some references here, like this has been uh, in uh, two papers. The most details you will find in my uh, thesis, uh, because there are some details about that are not described in the papers, but that's if you're really interested in. And most of these things, uh, most of these papers are available at my university page. And I'll take questions here. Thank you. <laughs>